I think it's both um, exciting and depressing that uh, messages like mine have an audience. Uh, <laughs> you know, I talk about really simple things like how to be fulfilled, you know, and like how to do things that inspire us and how to work for a company that sort of gets the best out of us and makes us feel good while they're doing it. And, and you know, it's kind of upsetting that people are even wanting to hear that, meaning that there's a demand for it. Um, um, but it also presents the most remarkable opportunity in the world, which means there's an opportunity for us to change the way um, work is done so that all of those things are not the exception, but rather the rule. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is the exception when somebody says, I love my job. You know, so you meet somebody at a bar, he's like, what do you do? Oh, I love my job. Oh, you're so lucky, right? It's like, that, that should be something special, is remarkable. And so, the amazing thing is, is that ability to say, I love my job, I love what I do, is actually not that complicated to find. And not ironically, it has nothing to do with the work that we do. It has everything to do with the people with whom we work. And you don't even have to like the people with whom you work. That's the most amazing thing of all. Um, if you think about it, in the military, there are people who are willing to risk their lives for people they don't even like. We don't even like to give up credit for things, you know? So what is it that creates an environment in which people care about each other so much that they would risk their lives for people that they don't even like, right, sometimes? This is remarkable to me. Um, human beings in all their complexity and all of the nonsense and all the messiness, um, what drives us is kind of simple. And this is what I like to research and learn about and write about, which is if you understand the very basic mechanics of this machine called the human being, it becomes fairly obvious as to what conditions in which the machine will perform well and in what conditions the machine will not perform well. Uh, very simply, uh, our machine is a social machine. We are social animals and we respond to the environment we're in. That's it. Um, good people are capable of doing very bad things if they're in the wrong environment. And people whose society may have given up on, if you put them in the right environment, are capable of performing remarkable, remarkable things. This is the job of leadership, which is to make that environment. The leader sets the tone, and the tone that is set will determine how we respond accordingly. And again, we are relatively simple in our motivations. If you go back to the Paleolithic era, when Homo sapien first stepped foot on the planet, um, about 50,000 years ago, there were other hominid species that existed at the same time, but we were the ones that survived. They died. We weren't necessarily the strongest, we weren't necessarily the fastest, and yet we've done quite well. Look at this remarkable world that we've built. One of the huge advantages we had, and have, is that we are social animals. And things like trust and cooperation are absolutely essential for our survival. They're not just nice ideas. They're absolutely essential. Um, you can imagine why. When we existed, when we lived in populations that never really got bigger than about 150 people, for 40,000 of the 50,000 years we've been on this planet, we never lived in populations bigger than 150 people. I understand scale presents some inherent problems. Um, but you can, um, you can understand the benefits of the group living. What it meant was I could fall asleep at night and trust that someone in my tribe would watch for danger. If I didn't trust the people in my tribe, I couldn't go to sleep. And this is not a very good system for survival or performance or anything, any other metric. It's the same at work. When we work with people with whom we trust, I don't need to double check your work. I don't need to see it before it goes out to, you know, I don't need, you don't need my approval, right? When we have trust, we can let people go do their work. And even if they're subordinate, we don't need to double check or approve or anything. Things will happen because we trust them, because we all have each other's backs. We all have each other's interests in mind. The problem with things like trust and cooperation is that they are not instructions. I can't simply tell you, trust me. You can't simply ask people to trust you in your advertising, and you can't simply tell people, I want you two to cooperate. Trust and cooperation are feelings, 
and this is the problem. So the question is, where do those feelings come from? Now again, we are basic, pretty simple in, in our motivation and our constructions. You can imagine what life, what color should I use? You can imagine what life must have been like in these Paleolithic times. It was a world filled with danger. All of these forces working extremely hard to kill us. Whether it was the weather or lack of resources, saber-toothed tiger, nothing personal, but all of these forces were working together to end our lives. And so, as tribal animals, we worked together and lived and worked amongst people around whom we felt safe. We felt like we belonged. And when we felt safe amongst the people with whom we lived and worked, the natural human response is trust and cooperation. It's just what happens. When we do not feel safe amongst the people with whom we work, however, the natural human inclination is cynicism, paranoia, mistrust, and self-interest. When we do not feel safe amongst the people with whom we work, if our leaders do not make us feel safe, we have no choice but to spend our own time and our own energy to protect ourselves from each other. When we do not fear each other, we naturally work together to face the dangers and seize the opportunities. It's the exact same thing in our modern business world. There are forces that are a constant and beyond our control that are working to kill you, right? Maybe I'm exaggerating. But there are forces outside, things like the uncertainty of an economy, the ups and downs of a stock market, a new technology that might render a business model obsolete overnight, um, your competition that sometimes is trying to kill you. It's trying to destroy that product or put you out of business, but at the very minimum is trying to frustrate your growth and steal your customers. These forces um, uh, are a constant and you have no control over them and never will. The only variable are the conditions inside the organization. And when those conditions are set in a manner that allows us to feel like we can trust and cooperate, we do. This is what leaders are supposed to do. There is an exact definition of leadership, and it is not my opinion. You know, I, 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 I love all the books that come out and all the articles. What makes a great leader? What are the five things you need to be a leader? You need charisma. You need vision. You know, all of these things. I can tell you right now, those things are sometimes useful, but they're not essential. Not everyone has vision. Does that mean they're, they're not allowed to be leaders? You know, some people have remarkable charisma and some people don't. Does that mean they will never lead? Of course, it's all nonsense. You can't manufacture these things. Some people are good strategic thinkers and some people are not. Some people are just naturally good at basketball and some people are not. There are skills, you can get better at them for sure, but you're either a visionary or you're not. These are not things that we can manufacture. In other words, they're not essential com components for leadership. There's only one characteristic that I'm comfortable saying that all leaders must have to become leaders, and that's courage. Because leadership is hard, and it often requires sacrifice, and the, the, con that it will happen, that you will have to put your interests, your comforts, your advantages aside so that others may gain. And that's sometimes really hard. In fact, standing up for others may mean that you might get your head chopped off. You know, a leader sometimes loses their job because they did the right thing, right? That comes with significant risk. The choice to be a leader comes at significant risk. And this is why not everyone chooses to be a leader. Leadership has nothing to do with rank. It has nothing to do with the title you have on your card. Leadership is a choice. That's it. I know many, many people who sit in the senior echelons of a corporation and they are not leaders. They are authorities, and they have authority, and we do what they say because they have authority over us. But we would not follow them. I know many people who sit at the bottom of organizations who have no authority, but they are absolutely leaders. And the reason they are leaders is because they have made a choice. They have chosen to look after the person to the left of them, and they have chosen to look after the person to the right of them. It doesn't always mean they have to sacrifice their interests, but when it really counts, sometimes they choose to sacrifice their interests because it's in the interest of the person to the left 
and to the right of them. This is what leadership is. The role of leaders is not an accident either. It's built into our anthropology. It's part of our survival, the reason we have hierarchy and we have leaders. For those times when we lived in these austere conditions, uh, we had a little bit of a problem. It was a very practical problem. Um, it wasn't necessarily enough food to go around all the time. You didn't we didn't have supermarkets and cars. We'd just go get milk. Sometimes there was food readily available and sometimes not. Which meant if someone brought home some food and we're living in a population of up to 150, we would all rush in to eat because we're all hungry. And if you were lucky enough to be built like a football player, you could shove your way to the front of the line. If you were the artist of the family, you would get an elbow in the face. This is not a good system for cooperation. It's not a good system for survival because the odds are that if I got punched in the face this afternoon, I'm not gonna wake the guy if I see danger. Bad system. And so we evolved into these hierarchical animals. We are constantly assessing and judging each other, who's alpha, who's beta. We are naturally hierarchical and we always organize ourselves in hierarchies. So even in meetings, we go to a meeting like, everybody's equal, I want you guys to work together. It's not gonna happen. We are never equals. We always assess, we always judge, we always allow some others uh, some deference and the role of leadership and some of us defer and sort of take a more uh, subordinate role. It always happens, not necessarily a bad thing. And again, the reasons are very practical based on our history. Because what would happen was when we would assess someone as our alpha, and let me be clear, your capacity to be an alpha in any population is not an absolute. It is relative to the population you're in. So uh, you might be a technologist or an engineer and you might think you're the hottest, best, most fantastic engineer and so does everybody else and you walk around like this and you go take a dance class, all of a sudden your ego is not so big anymore, right? <laughs> We've all had the experience, right? We've all had the experience where we shake someone's hand and we're nervous, you're not the alpha. You know, or when we can sense that someone's nervous meeting us, you're the alpha, right? It's, it's a relative scale. So when we assess that someone in the population is, our, is alpha, we voluntarily step back and allow them first choice of meat and first choice of mate. We let them eat first. We may not get the best choice of meat, but we will eat eventually, and we didn't have to get an elbow in the face to get that food. Good system. To this day, we are very comfortable with paying deference and offering advantages to those more senior than us. There's not a single person in this room, zero, that has a problem with somebody more senior than you at the company making more money than you as a salary, having a bigger salary than you. It doesn't bother you at all. You might think they're an idiot, but it doesn't actually bother you that they make more money than you because they outrank you. No issue. It doesn't bother us at all that somebody more senior than us has a bigger office or a better parking space. It is of no issue whatsoever. In fact, we very often find ourselves deferring to our alphas, doing nice things for our alphas. We open doors for them and call them sir and ma'am and get them tea and they didn't even ask. I can promise you that if as you were walking out of this room, if Steven Spielberg happened to walk in, walk in, you would hold the door open for him. And then you would go home and tell your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you'll never believe what happened today. I held the door open for Steven Spielberg. <laughs> How come you don't advertise when you hold the door open for anybody else? It's because we're proud to sometimes do menial labor for those who we perceive as alphas in our system. We're proud to work for the groups that they lead and the organizations that they lead. By the way, you can't lead a company. You can run a company. You can only lead people. And so this whole idea of deference and how we always defer and sort of volunteer to these alphas is a natural human response and it's a survival instinct and it's all about this. And that's the point. None of those perks that you get for being the leader, for being the alpha, none of them come free. They come at a very high expense. You see, the group is not dumb. We expect that the person who's better fed, the person who's actually stronger or smarter than us, the person who has a higher self-confidence, has more self-confidence because of all our love and deference and hello sir and hello ma'am and it actually boosts their self-confidence. We expect that this more confident, stronger, better fed person, when danger threatens the tribe, we expect them to rush towards the danger to protect us. That's the cost of leadership. That's why we gave you first choice of mate. 
because you might die. And we want to keep your genes in the gene pool. We're not stupid. And this is what it means to be a leader, the willingness to rush towards the danger to protect those in your care. It is a choice. You don't have to be a leader. It is a choice. If you don't like the costs of leadership, you may not accept the perks of leadership because they do not come for free. This is the reason why we are so viscerally offended by some of the banking CEOs have these disproportionate salaries and bonus structures. It's not the money that offends us. It's that we know deep inside us that they have violated the very definition of what it means to be a leader. They have accepted all of the perks and bonuses and benefits of being the leader, and yet they're not willing to make any of the sacrifices for the role that they have accepted. In other words, we know that they allowed their people to be sacrificed for them to keep their bonuses and perks and advantages. Worse, sometimes they chose to sacrifice their people to protect their bonuses and their perks. This is what so offends us. It's not the money. If I told you we're going to give a hundred and fifty million dollar bonus to Nelson Mandela, does anyone have a problem with that? No. How about a two hundred and fifty million dollar bonus to Mother Teresa? Got an issue with that? No. It's not the money. It's not the money. It's that leadership is a choice and in our modern day and age, unfortunately, many of the people who like to call themselves leaders are not leaders at all. They are authorities. That's all they are. And we have to do what they say because they have authority over us, but we would not follow them. And this is a problem. Because when we do not feel that they have our backs, when we do not feel safe working inside their organizations, they force us to spend our time and our energy to protect ourselves from them. And the organization itself suffers. It's what happens. It's ironic to me that organizations like your own who want to drive innovation and ideas and new ways of thinking would in the same breath lay people off because they didn't make the numbers in one year. You do realize that those two concepts are completely counterproductive. It's like talking to a CEO and I ask, what are your priorities? They say, we have two priorities, innovation and efficiency. Not possible. <laughs> there is nothing efficient about innovation. Try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, succeed. Not efficient. It takes so, you throw money to try things out. You can be innovative or you can be efficient. You can be efficient and hope for innovation and you can be innovative and hope for efficiency. There's always gonna be one subordinate to the other. Not bad, not better or worse, but let's not kid ourselves and think that they can be equal grounds. They cannot, it is impossible. But worse, an organization that claims or hopes or desires or aspires to be innovative must, at every expense, commit themselves to the safety of their people. Because only when we feel safe and protected will we voluntarily commit ourselves to the support of each other and the advancement of the vision. There are very simple ways to do this. Here are just a few. Great leaders would never sacrifice the numbers, would never sacrifice the people to save the numbers. Great leaders would sacrifice the numbers to save the people. And so when we live in a day and age where our leaders are so comfortable sending you home to tell your spouse and your kids, I'm sorry, I no longer have an income because the company had to make its numbers for the year. Forget about the people who lost their jobs. What about the people who didn't get laid off? How inspired do you think they feel to come back to work every day? How, do you, how safe do you think they feel? Do you think we're going to give our best knowing at the next time if the company doesn't make its numbers? By the way, which may or may not have anything to do with us. Remember all of those outside dangers, the ups and downs of technologies, the ups and downs of stock markets, the ups and downs of economies? You think when you have a bad year, you sit your children down and say, kids, it's been a bad year. We have to get rid of one of you. <laughs> or worse. Or worse. I got to keep my Mercedes. And so it's either you or the car, and we've picked you. 
right? No, we tighten the belt. We work together. We figure out ways to make it happen, to see it through the hard times. We cannot judge the quality of a crew based on how they perform in good times. We judge a quality of the crew by how they perform in rough waters. And unfortunately, we throw our crew overboard when we hit rough waters. What makes them want to commit to see the ships make it through the rough waters? What they do is they sit down and watch their own backs because nobody else is going to watch my back. There is no innovation in a group like that. There is no innovation in a group like that. Backstabbing, idea stealing, plenty of that. Nothing personal, got to look after numero uno. So number one, people come first. Numbers are always subordinate to people. Numbers will not rescue you in hard times. People will. Numbers will not come up with new ideas. People will. Numbers are not innovative. People are. That's number one. Another one which is really, really, really easy is honesty. It's really easy to be honest. Just tell the truth. <laughs> and if you tell the truth on a regular basis, we will say you have integrity. That's all it means. These are really basic concepts. So for example, if somebody calls and a secretary picks up the phone and says, Dave's on the phone, and you say, tell him I'm not here. You've just sanctioned lying inside your organization. That's what you've done. You have said that when it suits you, even if these lies are small, you may tell lies. That was dishonest. I went to visit Quantico Marine Base, where the Marine Corps chooses, selects their officers. And on the day I was there, true story, I was waiting uh, in a conference room for the colonel in charge of OCS to come and give us a briefing on, 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 on the base, about, about OCS, about this, the, the selection process. And he arrived late. Marines don't ever arrive late. And he showed up late. He came in and apologized. He said, I'm sorry, we've had an incident with one of our Marines. So I go, what happened? You know? <laughs> he said, well, we're considering throwing him out of OCS, which means throwing him out of the Marine Corps. Like, and I'm thinking, what law did he break? What did he do? So I said, what did he do? And the colonel said, um, he fell asleep on watch. And I said, that's it? <laughs> he fell asleep on watch in the woods of Virginia. <laughs> you know? I'm like, you guys are tough. He said, and then he explained. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, when we asked him about it, he denied it. When we asked him about it again, he denied it again. And only when we gave him irrefutable proof did he say, quote, I want to take responsibility for my actions. The problem we have, he said, is we believe you take responsibility for your actions at the time you perform your actions, not at the time you get caught. Mm. We have another Marine who fell asleep on watch. He admitted it. He got punished. We have no problem with him. And he went on to explain. He says, you have to understand, I cannot put this Marine in a leadership position where they're responsible for the lives of other Marines because if they are in a combat situation and his Marines doubt for one second that the words coming out of his mouth are anything but the truth, if they believe for one second that the words he is speaking are only to make himself look better or cover his own ass, trust will break down in the whole group and people will die. Now, we are not in life and death situations. But the way our minds interpret information that is given to us is in terms of life and death. This is why we don't trust politicians. They tell us the things we want to hear. We don't prima facie disagree with anything we've been told, but we know that they don't believe the things that they're saying. And so we as human beings, we're very, very smart, and this is always ingrained in us. We always make sure just to keep a safe distance from anybody who we don't believe is honest, because if we were to find ourselves in a life and death situation with them, you know what, I'm gonna, if I had to gamble, I'm gonna say, won't go with them. When someone is honest, they're willing to tell us good news, they're willing to tell us bad news, they're willing to be upfront with them. Even if it's news that we don't wanna hear, even if it's not in our interest, we're okay with it. We actually trust them. Hey, listen, I, I gotta be honest with you. Your performance has been really bad these days. I love this, we always talk about to give sandwiches. Give them the good news before you get to the bad news, right? So give them something general and generic that they don't believe anyway. Hey, you're really smart. <laughs> and on this one project that you did that you really completely, like it's really specific when they give us the negative, right? In other words, we didn't believe the positive in the first place. We knew they were just biding their time to get to the negative. Honesty. 
I'll give you another example of honesty and how we respond to it. Okay? We've all had this happen. <laughs> you get an email that says to you, Dear Simon, you, you, I'd get that. You wouldn't get that. <laughs> if you get that, send it to me. Uh, Dear Simon, haven't talked to you in years. Hope you're doing well. Congratulations on all your success. It's really amazing. Would love to catch up and get a cup of tea sometime. By the way, uh, I'm, if you could go to this website, I'm trying to raise money for a project I'm doing. I'd really appreciate it if you could vote for me or tweet it out. Thanks a lot, Dave. And what do you do when you get something like that? You're like, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? Now, what if we simply reverse the information? Uh, dear Simon, I'm trying to raise money for this project I'm doing. Would really appreciate it if you could click on the link and vote for me and maybe even tweet it out. Haven't seen you in years. Hope you're doing really well. Congratulations on all your success. Would love to get together with you for a cup of tea sometime, Dave. In other words, tell me the reason you sent me the email. Right? The niceties are fine, but that's not the reason you sent me the email. It was dishonest. It was disingenuous. Honesty is such a simple thing, right? It's such a simple thing, and when it is afforded to us, we respond with loyalty and trust and commitment and devotion and loyalty. Because why wouldn't we? By telling me accurate information, it helps me better survive. I like that. I appreciate that. I'm going to stand next to the honest one. Honesty is king. Hard, but important. And if we screw up, be honest about the screw up. I, I, I want you to know I wasn't honest with you. I was in a weird position and I should have told you the truth and I didn't. I got embarrassed and then I made it worse. I, know, I'm, I, don't, I don't know, I'm sorry. I, I'm ashamed. You know, like we can be honest about the failings even. We can accept punishments. Great organizations, if people screw up, you can be punished, but it doesn't mean you'll lose your job. If we fear that we will lose our jobs, we don't work in safe organizations. If we fear getting in trouble, that's okay. I mean, we, we fear getting in trouble from our parents. We don't fear that they're going to throw us out of the house, right? Same thing, same thing. Here's another thing that is easy to do and is a component of leadership, right? Um, allowing others to fail. My friend David Marquet, who wrote an amazing book called Turn the Ship Around, check it out, M-A-R-Q-U-E-T, um, was a naval, cap was a captain of a submarine, nuclear powered, Los Angeles class, fast attack sub. And uh, Marquet believed, like many of us do, that um, his credibility as a leader was closely tied to his competence, to his intelligence. You know, we believe that we have to know as much or more than those in our report because this is what gives us credibility as leaders, right? And so, in typical Marquet fashion, um, when he was assigned to one of the great honors of his career to be captain of his own submarine, the USS Olympia, he spent a year learning every button, every switch, every pipe, every valve of the submarine. He went through the dossiers of his crew. He knew everything about his crew. He was going to be prepared and he was going to know as much or more than everybody else on board because he was the captain now. He had to, he had no choice. Two weeks before he took command of the Olympia, he got a phone call that says, yeah, you're not going to be the captain of the Olympia. You're going to be the captain of the Santa Fe. It was a slightly newer submarine, still an Los Angeles class submarine, but Marquet realized because it was slightly new, some of the things were different and he didn't want anybody to know that he didn't know everything. And so he kind of kept it to himself and pretended he knew everything. But that's okay. You know, he's a smart guy, he's a competent guy. He obviously trusted him enough to be captain. He was fine. Then there was another little wrinkle. Where the Olympia was the best rated crew in the United States submarine fleet, the Santa Fe was the worst rated crew in the submarine fleet. They ranked last or close to last in almost every readiness measurement in the entire sub in what, uh, that the Navy had, right? But Marquet figured, that's okay, I have a bad crew, it's all right, I'm gonna be a good leader. If I give good orders, I'll have a good ship, and if I give great orders, I'll have a great ship. So they set sail, and about two or three days into, into, into being out there, you know, when they got ready, he was like barking orders, get ready for this, get ready for that, and, and everybody was following his orders, and off they went out to sea. It was a great feeling, everybody, when they do what you say, right? And about two or three days out, 
they were submerged and they decided to run an exercise. Um, so they turned off the reactor manually and pretended that they are having a meltdown and they ran the boat on battery power. It's called EPM, right? And Marquet decided he wanted to add a little tension, make the, see how, how well they would do with a with more difficult situation. Then he gave a simple order, a head two thirds. And what that means is run the boat two thirds its maximum speed. To his side was his navigator, who was the uh, second uh, in command at the time, at the, on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, in the, in the bridge. And uh, uh, he was also the most experienced sailor on board. He'd had two and a half years aboard the Santa Fe. And he repeated the order, ahead two thirds. And nothing happened. And Seaman Jones, junior sailor, sitting at the controls, was squirming, literally squirming in his seat. So Marquet peers out from the side of his periscope and says, Seaman Jones, what's the problem? And Seaman Jones replies, sir, there is no two-thirds setting. Apparently on this slightly newer Los Angeles, there was no two-thirds setting on the EPM. So he turns to his navigator and he says, did you know this? And the guy goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, then why did you give the order? He said, because you told me to. And that's when Marquet realizes He's aboard a ship he doesn't understand, and he has a crew that's trained for compliance. It's not like you can just turn around and ask for a new boat or change a crew out. We in the private sector think that we have an advantage because we can hire and fire people. You're assuming that we're hiring and firing the right people. We think that when things don't work, just change the people. Get rid of the, get rid of the weak links. Marquet didn't have this. This was his crew. He stuck with it. And it's not like uh, in anything else in the world, in submarines, there's no one person who dies. You either all live or you all die. That's it. Those are your options on a submarine. And so Marquet is forced to literally re-examine everything he understands about leadership because bad things will happen if this is the way it goes. And so one of the things he realized is he had a permission-based society aboard his boat. Sir, permission to dive to 400 feet. Permission granted. Aye, sir, diving to 400 feet. In other words, all the authority, all of the accountability lies with the person in charge, with the captain. If something goes wrong, the captain allowed it to happen. Marquet banned the words permission to aboard his boat and he replaced them with I intend to. The hierarchy is not affected at all, the chain of command is not affected at all. The difference is psychological. I intend to dive to 400 feet. All right. All the accountability lies with the person performing the action now. And so what started to happen was people took their jobs more seriously. And they started to ask each other for help because things went wrong. And instead of wanting to get permission from the boss, now, if the boss asked a question, you wanted to be able to have the answer. Which means when the boss says, did you check the depths? Sometimes he asked and sometimes he didn't. He said, did you check the depths? Of course I checked the depths. What are the depths? 400. You know? In other words, you could never be caught not knowing before you made a decision. Accountability went up. There are lots of other things that Marquet did, which he talks about in, in his book. Within a short period of time, the crew of the Santa Fe became the highest rated crew in naval history. Not that year, not the submarine fleet, in naval history. Same people, same equipment. It's not the people, it's the environment. It's always the environment, the people are fine. It's always the environment, and this is what leadership is. One of the things Marquet realizes is in most organizations, the people at the top have all of the authority, but none of the information. And the people who are actually performing the jobs have all the information, but none of the authority. And in most organizations, they try to get the information up. No, push the authority down. This is what creates great organizations. And what that does is it makes us feel that our work and our lives have value. We want to be given the opportunity to make mistakes. We want to be given the opportunity to work hard and have responsibility. It feels good to work hard to have responsibility for something. If somebody else, we've all had the experience, sometimes junior, sometimes senior in our jobs. I can remember in my own career, I used to have a boss who did the opposite. And I would write, a, I would write something and she would cover it in red pen and tell me to make her changes. And so I'd go make her changes. I'd come back and she'd cover it in red pen and tell me to make her changes. 
And at some point, I stopped caring about the quality of my first draft because I knew she was just going to change it all to whatever she wanted anyway. No longer felt valuable or valued. As opposed to telling me the macro issues she had, this is not clear. I, I know what you're trying to say, but it doesn't come across. Try again. Responsibility. Accountability. I remember the first time that somebody gave me accountability. I had to produce something that I had to send out to the client. The norm was to show it to my boss before it went out to the client. Except this time, he decided to leave early. And I said, well, do you want me to email it to you before, you know, before it goes out? And he goes, no. Good night. Make sure it goes out tonight. Bye. Now, I knew what good was, and I knew what had, had to be done, and guess what? He was fine. And I worked hard. I wanted to do it right. One of the things great leaders do is they allow us to try and fail. And one of the thing talks, one of the things Marquet talks about is the importance of training and the importance of practice and the importance of small projects. Because you can punch a hole in the side of the ship above the waterline and you fix it. It costs some money, whatever. But you do that over and over again so that you don't punch a hole in the side of the ship below the waterline. In training, metrics are supposed to go down because you want people to try hard and fail and find out where the line is. In combat training, you want them to get shot because you want them to find where getting shot happens. You don't, want, you don't want to outscore everybody else in training. It's ridiculous, right? This is the time to push the limits or give people little projects that at the worst, think about what we do for a living, right? Nobody here is looking for a cure for cancer or working in an ER. The worst thing we can do, the absolute worst, is lose a multi-billion dollar corporation some money. And not enough, that will get noticed. <laughs> and if it is enough to get noticed, it won't put you out of business. Like seriously, death and destruction in Armageddon are nowhere to be seen. That's the worst. And so when we have leaders that understand that and allow us to try and fail and try and fail and understand that if we screw it up, it's okay, the ship's not gonna sink, now try again. Let's sit down and talk about maybe what you would like to do differently next time. I want you to learn. I want you to try again. Kind of like what we do with our kids. And that's the final point. The closest analogy I can give to you about what leadership is, is parenting. Think about what makes a great parent. You know, first of all, not having kids is a better life. <laughs> you, got, you get a bigger house, you take nicer vacations, you can get the car you want, not the car you have to get, right? Much more sleep, right? Yet we choose, for some reason, to have children. We choose to make these sacrifices because in time, it's kind of worth it to see this little thing grow up and make something of themselves that we, we got to look after. It's kind of worth it. The problem with leadership, the problem with parenting, is they're both like exercise, is they cannot be measured in small, discrete chunks. I can give you a compelling presentation about the importance of exercise, and it'll change your life and improve the quality of your life and let you live longer. And you'll believe me, and you'll go to the gym, and you'll come back, and you'll look in the mirror, and you will see nothing. But you go the next day, and you will come back, and you will look in the mirror, and you will see nothing. And worse, you're in pain. And so you have no metrics to show there's any value to anything I've told you, so you stop. But if you can stick with it, after three months, you look at an old picture of yourself, and you're like, I can't believe I ever looked like that. You can't, I can't believe it. Leadership and parenting are the same. You have no idea if you're being a good parent on a daily basis. None. In fact, sometimes, you're a bad parent. <laughs> but you kind of have a sense of what it should be, and you stick with it, and there are these little glimmers that you get that make you proud that you're kind of doing the right thing and that the sacrifice is worth it, like the little things that the kids do, but you won't actually see a return on your investment, investment for like 30 years. <laughs> you know, some of our parents are still waiting for us. <laughs> right? Leadership is the same. I have, I have no way of measuring that you're being a good leader on a daily basis. Even the best leaders are sometimes terrible leaders on a daily basis. There's no good metric. The problem is, is it's very hard to measure in short, discrete packets, but it's very easy to measure over distance, over time. 
That's the problem. Good, good leadership is obvious. You measure it in things like uh, churn. You know, how many, what's the average lifespan of your employees? I love reading all these reports that say, well, the trend is that people are spending less and less time at their jobs now, and maybe it's because they're looking for more adventure. No, it's because they don't feel safe, and why would they stick around? There's no loyalty. It's not a good trend. It's a symptom. Parenting. Think about what a great parent is. A great parent is willing to sacrifice, give of, them of themselves, you know, discipline when necessary, provide opportunities, provide education, Also, this young little thing can grow up and achieve more than they thought they ever could for themselves. What's a great leader? Somebody who's willing to sacrifice and give of themselves and provide opportunities, education, discipline when necessary, sometimes help them up, sometimes make them get up themselves, all so they'll grow up and build confidence and achieve things I couldn't even achieve for myself. Same thing. There's a photograph in the New York Times uh, a few bunch of months ago. Do you remember those uh, shootings in Kenya? And the amazing thing was there was a photographer who was on the scene. Usually we see the aftermath, right? And this particular one, there was a photographer in the mall. Um, and so we got to see pictures of what was going on. And there's one photograph, you can look it up, it's online. Um, there's one photo, it's Taylor Hicks is the photographer's name, not the same Taylor Hicks. Um, there's a, photo there's a photograph of a mother lying on top of her child. Okay, now think about that. At the sound of a gun, it's a mother's instinct to throw herself onto her child, potentially risking her own life to ensure that the life of this young, precious thing will survive her. Now, on other days, mom gets to do what mom says because I'm the mom. And sometimes mom takes the liberties and enjoys the liberties of being the leader and being the one in charge. But when it matters, when the child's life, survival are at stake, there's no question what a good mother does. They throw themselves on top of their child, no question asked, even at personal sacrifice. That's called leadership. That's what our leaders do. They can enjoy the trappings, enjoy the perks, enjoy the parking spaces, enjoy the money. Nobody says you have to give them up. In fact, we would be upset if you gave them up because it's our pleasure to do these things for you. You know, can you imagine if Steven Spielberg, you know, uh, you made him a cup of coffee, he said, I can make my own cup. It actually would feel bad, like we want, we want to do these things, it brings us joy to do these things. Just like it brings our kids joys, joy to make us proud, and it gives us joy to make our leaders proud. We want to do right by them. But we do so with the knowledge that they would sacrifice themselves for us. Back in the Marine Corps, this idea of leadership is viewed as a responsibility, not as a rank. You will never hear these words spoken in the Marines. You will never hear the words, I am a leader. I believe I have what it takes to be a leader. I aspire to be a leader. Those words do not exist. Here are the words they speak. I am a leader of Marines. I believe I have what it takes to be a leader of Marines. I aspire to be a good leader of Marines. In their own vernacular, they view leadership as a responsibility to another human being and not a rank to be attained. It's the same for us. You're not a leader. You're a leader of people. And to say I am a leader is false. I'm a leader of people. I aspire to be a leader of people. I believe I have what it takes to be a leader of people. I want to be the best leader of people I can possibly be. And we are reminded every time we speak the words that our responsibility is to another person. Like the word parent, I am a parent. Inherent in that word is that there's a child. You can't call yourself a parent without a child. I'm a parent of a child. It comes with certain responsibilities inherent, as does leadership. And so this manifests in some funny ways in the Marine Corps. If you go to any chow hall anywhere in the world, on any marine base, what you will see is they will line up in rank order during chow time. Most junior man eats first, most senior man eats last. It is not in any rule book, and no one tells them they have to. It happens organically because of the way they simply view the responsibility of leadership. That I, as the leader, like a parent, would let my child eat before I eat. That's just what we do. And so that's one of the ways it shows up. I was told a true story. I was told a story of a Marine officer who was deployed and they, had, they were eating 
um, among, with the group, and the, the, that officer made sure that his men ate first, as is the custom in the Marine Corps. And they ran out of food. The officer didn't get to eat. So when they went out back into the field, all of his men brought him some of their food so that he may eat. This is what happens. When we as leaders commit to the safety of our people, our people will give us their blood, sweat, and tears, and they will make their own sacrifices to ensure that we are kept safe and to ensure that our visions are advanced. We cannot sit here with our arms folded and simply complain that our leadership doesn't look after us, that our leadership doesn't get it, that they would sooner sacrifice us to save the numbers and they would never sacrifice the numbers to save us, that they listen to Wall Street, they don't put people first, they claim they drive innovation but they're not creating the environment that would create innovation. We cannot complain because we must be the leaders we wish we had. We have a person to the left of us and we have a person to the right of us that we can take responsibility for. Sure, you don't love your job, but do they? Are you committing yourself to ensuring that they feel happy, that they feel safe, that they have the job they love, that they feel like they're learning, that they feel they have opportunity? We have entire sections in the bookshop called self-help. We have no sections called help others. <laughs> and yet the science is clear. Our own sense of happiness, our own sense of fulfillment, our health, and indeed the success of the organization itself are tied entirely to our willingness to serve those in our tribe, to look after those who would we, we would call brother and sister, which we don't do in companies. We have colleagues. In the military they have brothers and they have sisters. We don't always like our brothers and sisters, but my goodness, you threaten my brother or my sister and you gotta deal with me. When you talk about challenging authority, what are you talking about? You know, um, when we're talking about challenging conventional thoughts and conventional ideas, when we're talking about taking responsibility, the, in the military and especially in the Marines, they're expected and they're taught to think for themselves. And the idea of hierarchy um, is very much geared to something they call commander's intent, right? In other words, the commander tells us what they need to achieve, but they, they will not meddle in how it will be achieved. The problem in our corporations is we're told what, we, what they want to achieve and how we're going to do it. And so the opportunity to challenge authority is obvious is because you're giving us something to, to challenge. Whereas in a, in a well-running unit, the commander will say, I need to take that hill. And it's for the lower level leadership to figure out how to take that hill. And then it's for the le 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 level of leadership beneath that to figure out, okay, this is how we're going to do our component of it. And so there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of respect given to the layers of leadership. Here, not so much. Uh, by here, I mean corporations, not so much. And so it also goes to the concept of humility. The best definition of humility I ever heard uh, was given by Bob Gaylor, the, the, the former uh, chief, of, um, uh, chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. He said, do not confuse humility with meekness. Humility is being open to the ideas of others. And I love that. You know, you can have the biggest ego in the room. Hum being humble is not like, oh no, it's not me. You know, that's not humble. Humble is when somebody says, I got an idea, you go, let's hear it. And actually be willing to hear what they have to say. That's humility. And, and so great leaders have the humility that they, they may not have all the answers and they don't know how to get there. And it also goes to a question of priorities, right? Which is, which is based on bonus structures. We are largely incentivized to grow a number within the year. That's how we get our incentives. And we are not incentivized to create something stable that will last 100 years. And so what you have is a lot of large, relatively unstable organizations. Well, that's what they wanted, that's what they got. Um, we're fast growing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. It's good for the year, right? This, this is. We were just talking about this at lunch. This is the difference between. This is. This is. This, this is the. This is the folly of the stock market, right? Make sure this is on the camera. <laughs> I'll make sure it's on the camera. Dude in the middle. Okay. 
This, if you look at like General Electric in the 80s and 90s, this is what their, their stock chart looks like. So if you were lucky enough to sell at the right time, you would have made, you know, I don't know, 1,800% on your money, you know, if you invested in the early 80s. Um, this is not investing. This is gambling. This is investing. We invest in our children. We invest in education. <laughs> right? We invest in something that we don't see the result in a year. Gambling is about hope. I hope this works out. It's about betting. I bet on your new product. I bet on your new CEO. I bet on your reorg. I bet on your acquisition. I invested in you because I hope that that decision that you just made today, I bet it's going to work. Oh. <laughs> Costco was criticized by Wall Street year after year after their year by stupidly prioritizing employees and customers and ignoring the shareholder. If you had invested a dollar in General Electric and a dollar in Costco the day Costco went public, which was December of 1985, you would have compared to today, you would have enjoyed a 600% return on your investment in General Electric. You would have enjoyed a 600% return on your investment in the S&P 500. And you would have enjoyed a 1200% return on your investment in Costco. That's investing. If you were lucky enough to get out of GE at the right time, you would have made a little more. But that's not investing, that's gambling. I got no issue with it. I got no issue with gambling, and I got no issue with taking bets. Just call it like it is. We're betting versus we're investing. So if we're saying we're doing something for our shareholders, we don't have shareholders anymore, we have share squatters, right? <laughs> think about it. Just this, 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 think about this for one second. We're going to take counsel from a disinterested outside party that when we do well, they'll invest in us anyway. And if we do badly, they're not loyal and they're not going to stick with us. Hmm. Hmm. I'll stop there. <laughs> and the joke is, that's better for the shareholder. And it's stable. And it's innovative. And people love working there. And they look after each other. And they don't spend tons of money on churn because nobody quits. It's good. Forget about idealism. Forget about soapboxes. I'm talking business. I'm talking the free market. This is better for the free market.